Hi, I'm Phil Skipper. I'm the Head of Business Development for Vodafone's Machine to Machine Business. Today I'll be talking about the IoT, the connected car and how mobility will change in the future. Um, you've heard a couple of things today around, you know, have telcos got machine to machine businesses? We have and we've got a really big one. And it's actually staffed by people who aren't actually from telcos. So this whole multidisciplinary thing we've got sorted as well. And today I'm going to talk to you a little about the connected car. Um, and I'm going to make one apology. This is a connected car presentation, which means I'm allowed to make as many puns as I like. OK, so please bear with me. and We'll add up the number of puns at the end. Now, this is Vodafone's end-to-end -end mission statement. And it's to connect every machine to transform lives of business. Now, frankly, we've done the first bit. And, you know, we keep talking about the IoT. It's all about connecting devices and all that. It's actually not. It's actually about how do you transform not our business model as a telco, so how do we get paid? It's actually how do our customers transform their customers' business process and what role do we want to play in that as a telco? So, you know, for me, the IoT is nothing to do with technology. It's all about service. And if you look at a telco, we are a service company. We have to provide a service every time the person presses the green button. That's our job. So let's have a look at where the journey's begun. In the connected car, it really was triggered by the regulation around e-call and then b-call. So emergency call, so if you crash in the highlands of Scotland, somebody will come along and rescue you. Now, there's been a number of high-profile cases recently around where that would have been a really fe useful feature to have now. So that is the technology piece. Someone's gone, oh, we can do that, and we can use my our communications to do it. That's fantastic. Um, then the car manufacturer said, well, actually, if we're going to connect the car, what else can we do with the data that we get? And the first thing is to do remote maintenance and control. Can you get diagnostic data out of your car and provide more information to you as the manufacturer? So that's like taking product lifecycle management outside of the factory. You then move on and say, well, actually, if I know how the car's performing, how can I link the customer back to me as an automotive brand? Because one of the big problems is when the car goes out of warranty, typically people don't use the main dealer anymore. They go and use the guy around the corner. That's a huge loss to the main dealers. How can they use this connectivity to pull people back into them? Then, of course, you've got how can you sell more services? And that's really just about cranking the old sausage machine, about selling more bandwidth through things like infotainment. And then the big dream at the end is all about the autonomous car, how can we take control of the car so it drives itself um, and we don't have to do anything? Um, I travelled on a fairly autonomous vehicle this morning. It's called a train. So we shouldn't actually be that surprised. You know, we go, oh, it's all, it's all new. Actually, it's not. So there's a real thing here about you know, people are looking at this and saying, how can we use the technology that we've got to actually sell the same? But they're selling it in a very similar model. We look at this from a very different perspective. As Vodafone M2M, we look at how this thing is going to evolve. And technology is a key enabler. And um, you mentioned something about how can you have a B2B and a B2C contract. We've actually done that. We actually have a SIM card that you can fit in that has a B2B service channel for things like e-call and diagnostics, but also has a separate B2C channel where somebody can download infotainment and have a Wi-Fi hotspot in the car. Now, once you've got something like the internet in the car technology, you're already enabling multiple entities to access the same point of contact. And that point of contact is the driver in the car. So we can provide a service for e-call and diagnostics at one fixed price for the life of the car. And then you can contract for services around watching Little Mermaid in the back of your car on a separate deal. So that infrastructure is already in place. We're already billing both B2B and B2C models. And I think these are the types of things where you've got to open your mind up and really understand what the ecosystem will look like and how does that play further down the line into things like car-to-car -car connectivity. And that's going to be something that's very critical um, as you move towards the autonomous vehicle landscape. Now, the connected car actually isn't a technology, it's a service. Now, we, we look at this thing, and I think many telcos get obsessed a little around the sort-it-out-yourself process. 
which is where you have a smartphone application in your pocket, and all that happens is you're told of the problems that you have. So I have one of these, and I have a smart home. If somebody breaks in, I'm told that there's somebody breaking into my house, and I am three and a half hours away. Now, all that does is it increases my blood pressure. It doesn't actually help me solve the problem. What customers want to buy is an outcome. And the outcome that we're doing in connected cars is not to say that your car has been stolen, but to actually say your car has been stolen, we have found it, and a man will come along with a set of keys for the hire car. A set of keys. <laughs> a set of keys for the hire car so you can actually get home tonight. Now, I don't need to know that my car's been stolen because I know the police are going to hold it for ages. I just need to get home and I don't want to stand in the rain. That's the outcome that people actually want. And what we see is going forward, the future of the IoT is about putting people back into the IoT. It's not about stripping out technology. It's, it's not about taking people. It's not about cost. It's about providing an end customer service that someone's prepared to pay for. Having something on a smartphone, you know, I can turn my temperature up and all that. That's great for a bit, but it's very much like a soda stream application. Once you're bored with it and you've got your house set up, it goes in the cupboard under the sink and it stays there. And when you move, there's 15 soda streams under your sink. Now, you've got to have the service concept. And when you ask the question, do we think we're a service company? Absolutely, yes, we do. We provide end customer services directly to B2B and B2C customers. Now, when you look at the connected car, um, frankly, it's nothing new. I ran a fleet of 600 vehicles many moons ago, and that connected car was called fleet management. I had devices in cars, and I could tell where people are, and I could keep an eye on them, I could see what speeds they were doing. Fleet management, it's already done. We're now seeing that as we move along, we're seeing usage-based insurance, we're seeing e-call, but much more importantly, we're seeing a range of other services come in, like things like crash reconstruction. So with our UBI systems that we have, our usage-based insurance systems, if you have a crash, the first thing we do is we provide a crash reconstruction report. And that says where you were, how fast you were traveling, what the road conditions were like, what speed you crashed at, where the crash was in terms of the car, how many people were in the vehicle, what's the orientation of the car, and so on. Now, that's really interesting because that goes straight to the insurance company, and the insurance company can intercept that claim at what's called the point of first notification. Now, if you're the guy that gets first notification of loss, you've got control over the claims process. You can use the garages which you've chosen where you've got better deals, and you can start to really manage the cost of a claim. Now, that's really the benefit. It's not about selling insurance. It's all about managing claims. And I think we need to look at these companies and say, what does an insurance company do? An insurance company gives you a piece of paper in exchange for some money. That's called a policy. And then it manages its risk and it manages its cost if you ever have a claim. That's where this technology goes in. And I should apologise for the formatting, which is somewhat odd. Um, but if you look, there's a whole load of other services which come in the connected car before you even get to autonomous vehicle. You've got infotainment, absolutely right. You've got breakdown assistance. You've got emissions monitoring, which may be an interesting thing that comes up. You know, what's going to be the rules for independent emissions testing going forwards? You've got driver support systems. We've seen a lot of that already in terms of monitoring systems, both inside and outside of the car. Um, you've got vehicle to grid with electric cars coming in. But more importantly, is as we move down the line, you've got things like you know, Uber. Everyone talks about Uber. Uber is a very different business model. It's not about running a taxi company. It's actually about providing mobility as a service. You've got things like multi-multed journeys. You've got mobility as a service and you've got the peer-to-peer -peer economy. Now, my car is sitting in a car park, um, generating me no money, and it's just taking money out of my bank account right now. Um, why do I need to own the asset? And I think when you talk about these services and you talk about the business models, you need to look fundamentally at why people travel. Now, you know, we keep thinking that if we've got a car, it gives us independence, it gives us freedom, and all of those types of things. 
do we think that's actually going to be the way forward? Do we think autonomous driving, where we do nothing, is actually a solution to the mobility problems of the future? So we look at it very much and say, there will be an element of autonomous more technology, but what you're going to see is a big change in the way people take mobility as a service. A good example is car sharing. Um, you know, we partner with Drive Now, very successful program in London. That's all about utilisation of vehicles. It's got nothing to do with technology in the car. It's about having a car that's used all the time. So let's go and have a look um, and say, what's the route to the autonomous car? We've all seen the car on the left, um, and we all hope we're going to move to the car on the right. Now, the picture on the right is really interesting, and it sums up what I think is the problem in terms of the way people perceive these moves. So we look at it very much as being incredibly disruptive. This is about moving and buying mobility as a different kind of service. Just look at that picture. You've got two people there um, who are in an autonomous vehicle, moving around, they're trusting their life to an autonomous vehicle, yet they're still wearing seatbelts. Now, I don't wear a seatbelt on the train. Now, that's pretty much an autonomous vehicle. If I'm trusting that car to drive me, why do I need to be strapped in? On the other hand, they're so comfortable with the autonomous vehicle, they've got rid of the cup holder. So, you know, these are the things where you can't be half committed to the problem. You've either got to be all there or not there at all. And the secret is, if you're going to do that, don't even face the right way. Don't even think of it in the format of a car. If we're really going to talk about autonomous vehicle, you've got to talk, think about mobility as a whole. And that's really the position Vodafone take. And just to give you some examples. Everyone is getting dreadfully excited about Google cars rushing about. But you know, and we as telcos go, 5G is going to be the answer. 5G is going to really solve the problems to all of this. It's going to give us you know, high data rates, low latency, and the rest of it. And it will do. But um, is it actually going to solve the congestion problem? You know, having cars on the road which are autonomous rather than driven isn't going to help me in that situation. Um, there's 38 million vehicles on the road today. There will be a time where there's one autonomous vehicle and 28 million non-autonomous vehicles. How do you manage that and maintain the efficiency? So you're going to have a car that's trying to deal in 1 to 38 million, and in the future, all the technology that you've got will be shared across all the other 38 million vehicles. So the first cars you make will, by definition, be incredibly inefficient. Um, traffic lights and road signage. How do you get all that aligned so these cars can actually recognise what the road conditions are like? Yeah, you can do it on GPS and you can do it with all these things and mapping and the rest of it, but there's a whole infrastructure that needs to be replaced. And also, you know, do people really want to move in that way in the future? What's going to be the market for autonomous vehicles when you're going to find that with urbanisation, you're going to find that people will actually commute in much smaller areas? And I did a study um, in London. You talk to young people. Um, you know, they've never been to Richmond if they live in Islington, but they have been to Cancun, China, Beijing, all these. You know, they work in this spider mode. They don't move around like old people like me, where I live up in the Midlands and I work down in Newbury. That is a defunct model, and I think we need to be really clear on that. So, and then, you know, when you look at that, it's a much bigger problem than just the technology. And if I was just going to sum up in the last couple of minutes... The connected car is already here. You can go and buy them today. They're really good. Buy them from Vodafone. The Vodafone's connected car technology in. You can't go wrong, trust me. Secondly, um, you've got to exploit the connectivity assets with content. So that's the next immediate step. How do you get more value over the connectivity that you've actually installed in the car? The next point is really about these new business models. Now, they will evolve the entire proposition. It's not just evolving one thing to another, it's asking the fundamental question, how do people want to buy mobility in the future? Autonomous driving technology will continue to evolve, but the crucial point is we look at cars as independent elements today. As we move down this line, that mobile vehicle will become incredibly closely tethered to fixed infrastructures, be that road, be that rail, 
be electricity. All of these things will become one. Now, you've got to really think about that and say, what is the solution when mobility and infrastructure collide? And there's a pun just to finish off with. But this whole thing about, you know, we look at the autonomous car in the business model that we have today, that everyone could drive around wherever they like. When that car is part of an existing infrastructure, how does that change the way people perceive mobility? Now, the final point, you know, I don't come from the telco industry at all. Um, I come from every other industry, but the reason I'm in telco is I think with the Internet of Things, with M2M, with things like autonomous driving, there is no better time to be in the communications business. This is where it's all going to happen over the next five to ten years. So that's just a short journey to pun again on the evolution of the connected car. Um, and if you have any questions, um, I'll be more than happy to take them, or if you want to take those later. Thank you very much.